wonderful. Okay. Very clear. Oh, thanks, Christine. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so, Laotzu says here, if you want to awaken all of humanity, then awaken all of yourself. If you want to eliminate the suffering in the world, then eliminate all that is dark and negative in yourself. Truly the greatest gift you have to give is that of your own self transformation. How wonderful is that? So we are here as transformers. And as we self transform, everything around us transforms, isn't it? <clears throat> so with that in mind, if you'd like to take the mic, for the next half, half hour, let's just share what you get out of that. And if you'd like me to type it out on the chat box so you can see, let me know and you can read it as well. In fact, I shall do that actually. want to awaken all of humanity then awaken all of yourself and that's what we are here for isn't it for those of you who are involved in the um knights of holy cross this is quite pertinent then eliminate Dark and negative in yourself fully honest gift. To give is that of your own self. There you go. Because <clears throat> one of the mantras I go by is that masters live in transformation and the masses live in the positive and negative. They get caught up in the good and evil and the negative and the positive get, getting caught up in the drama. But true masters we're here to transform and the beauty about it is that we've got christ christ to really assist us as well as all the friends in high places that guides us and shows us the truth and reveals light so free to, to take the mic let me know if you want to take the mic so I'll unmute you and see what you get out of it. Because this is about group work. This isn't it, Miko? Miko? Particularly that if you're doing the intense work of the, um, you know, Knights of the Holy Cross, those guys who've been oiling and salt and dealing with the obelisk. Now we're dealing, it looks silly, but in the spiritual realm, in the celestial realm, there's power in what you're doing. And so obviously the dark forces are not going to like you at all. And they're going to pick on your weak, on your weakness. Whatever your weakness is, they're gonna go, go for it. So as we gather together on Sundays, we're here to support each other, give each other, be a cheerleader to one another. So we're a cheerleader for ourselves first, and then we, we cheer each, each other on and encourage one another. So free to take the mic and what you get out of it. Let's have a, let's really have a conversation and get to it.
Hmm, thanks, Sam. Let's unmute you. Okay, go for it, Sam. Hi, Grace. Hey, everyone. Um, as you were reading that out this morning or this afternoon for me, um, oh, I just, it woke up every cell in my body. Um, it's a really good, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of, reminder. Like you can often look outside of yourself as to what, how you want to help humanity and your community and stuff. But this is a real reminder of the, the true and most effective way to help people is to awaken yourself and to do the work mm. um, because it is really true that when if all of us are doing that we're you know we're all connected in the spiritual world and that sort of raises the vibration of the planet as we do that and it mm. just um i can relate to that attacking weaknesses that you mentioned just before because i started the oil and salt this week and um yeah, I've had a um I've had a couple of unpleasant experiences this week. Mm, yeah. Were you, able to, were you able to deal with it? Yeah. I was. Yeah, it was all um I've had a lot of migraines throughout my life. And um yeah, this week I had just this massive migraine. And not only that, it was like it was like there was a vice on the base of my skull, and it was just making me crazy dizzy. Like I, I wouldn't be able to drive if I tried. Um, yeah, for about a day and a half, but it's um it's gone now. So yeah, yeah. So when you do the soul, because you're doing soul uh, family with William, when you do that in that session, ask William to remove that thing off you. Okay. Mm because obviously there's a hook in your, underneath your skull. <clears throat> there's a hook in there, so um, you just gotta release it. Yeah, no, so thank you, Grace. That's a great reminder mm. of, really, of really where to focus, I guess. And what's important to work on that then goes out like ringlets, like a, like if you drop a drop a stone into a pool of water and all the, the ringlets get further and further out from it because it affects everything. It's kind of the same, hey? Absolutely. And as you're doing the work on the outside, obviously the ripple effect goes back inwardly. And so it's like a mirror effect, isn't it? So just as well as you're clearing on the outside, guess what's going to happen to you? Yeah, clearing on the inside as well. <laughs> and if we're not prepared for it, um, it's going to cause us off balance and misalignment. Yeah. <clears throat> and the quickness, if we can just get be on our toes and we move quickly, and the beauty about it is we've got the Holy Spirit to really guide us and assist us. Yes. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Not doing a great job, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I mean, for us people, it's not quite normal, isn't it? That's right. The people out there is the weird ones. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Just like anything, before we can deal with matter, we've got to deal with the spirits. Spirit always came first before matter. And spirit and effect. How, yeah. In the beginning, what was the earth was void and empty and dark darkness was covered over the earth and then the spirit came to bring light and so if there's any darkness in us in our earth in our terrestrial plane within us then the spirit can hover and bring light to it and we just open up ourselves yeah. so really it sounds easy but to surrender and to um, just let go is such a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Mm. So who else would like to take the mic? Let's get this flowing, guys. As we flow, we'll shift and we'll really do something in our energy field. 
we'll go into the quantum. Okay, so we'll have Miko first and then Nolene. Hi Grace, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, yeah, like um, you're saying, yeah, oh no, the, the weather's beautiful. I'm, I'm having some time outside, it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, I've had to deal with uh, not so nice things. One of them being um, vexatious ex. So he is, um yeah so I'm, I'm having to deal with that which isn't very pleasant at the moment and yeah and I, I get what you're saying about not being drawn into that like the drama of things so I'm pretty much just yeah because that's what I used to do when I was with him I just got drawn into the drama and fight and everything and now I'm just staying detached and I'm just gonna let you know the lawyer do the talking mm. Yeah, but other than that, it's been pretty good. That's great. You sound a bit lighter today. You're getting lighter and lighter each time I talk to you. I hear you. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did another ritual at the beach the other day. <laughs> did you? Um, while I was on my date. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Did he join in as well? Yeah, he joined in. He's fantastic. He used to be like a Buddhist monk, so <laughs> he's like very open minded. And I said, Well, join in. And yeah, he joined in. Oh, wonderful. Find someone that's evenly yoked with you so that you can do the work together. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that's so important. Because then there's no friction and there's no, um, you know, there's nothing, there's no blockages. It's just a flow, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, and it strengthens the, the exercise I found when I had two of us doing it. I really felt like it was being um, compounded. It was more effective. Yeah, well, in Psalms it says... One person can slay 1,000, but yeah, if you have two, you can slay 10,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. No, I really mm. felt the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Miko. So we'll have Nolene. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? Um, Miss, and just to let everyone know, Nolene has actually started her own podcast. <laughs> it's for other ladies. So if you guys are, want to listen into her podcast, they're on every Monday mornings. Thanks, Grace. <laughs> I thought I'd put in a little bit of pitch for you. A little bit of a plug for us. And this week's <laughs> topic is uh, the five love languages for anybody who's interested. So... Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> it's all right. It's only for half an hour. So as you're doing the dishes, whatever, doing some dusting, half an hour and listening to the ladies chit chat. Yeah, half an hour to 45 minutes. This one's a little bit longer. It's about 40 minutes. So, uh, yeah, so get, grab a cuppa. <laughs> thanks for the plug, Grace. It's called Ladies Let's Talk for anyone who wants to have a listen to it. So, um, but I just wanted to, I just laughed because... You know, we always talk about timing and synchronicities and all that sort of stuff. And I was having a, some messenger conversations with a couple of people this morning about a video that was shared with me this morning. And one of the people I was talking to was, she was saying that she was, you know, careful about what she put on Facebook and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I just said, I'm not putting anything on Facebook because... And I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't putting anything into the social media about anything at the moment. And when you talked about having to do the inner work first, you know, how can you awaken the world, awaken yourself? And I was like, that's because that's why I'm not doing it on social media because I'm not there yet. So it was just a penny drop. So that was just the message that I needed from the universe to say, it's okay, you're good. Keep going on the track you're going. So thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Well, I think we've known each other for all this time, um, Nolene, because if we're truly mastering ourselves, we're mastering our transformation, aren't we? Yeah. And yeah. yes, social media has its place, but when you, when you look at it, social media is all about on the outside. And so we are eternal, internal people journeying within. So before we can go out there, what do we need to do to first? Yeah, that's right. And I, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to language that this morning and I couldn't quite pinpoint it. But then as soon as you said it, I was like, Oh, that's why, because I'm doing that internal work. So yeah, it was perfect timing and perfect confirmation that I'm, I'm where I need to be right at the moment. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I've had a bit of a rough week this week, but, uh, yeah, coming back to Perth has been a little bit challenging. Uh, I realised that that I felt the energy up here is a lot heavier than in Albany, and I've really struggled with that. Uh, mm. However, I'm <laughs> about to go out bush, so I'm sure the energy out there will be much better. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone from the beautiful energy of Albany to the density of Perth to the beautiful energy of the outback, so I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, what's the role of the filter? <laughs> I know I don't like it in Perth. There's too much here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, well, it's great to have you in Perth because the filters um, take that on board and transform it for us, eh? Well, that's why I'm getting out real quick. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll do my filtering from afar. Thanks. <laughs> Being in the desert, great place to be. Yeah, I reckon. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, it was, it, everything is, uh, as we've always said, everything happens at the right time for the right reasons. So, uh, good message this morning. Thank you. Uh, I might get you to send it to me too, cause I missed out the, the chat, copying it from the chat this morning. So I'll uh, grab it from you again later. Yeah, sure. I'll, um, I'll send it to your messenger if you like. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. That's wonderful. Don't you love synchronicity? I love <clears throat> synchronicity. <laughs> uh, so who else would like to take the mic Christine where are you I can't see you on here Oh, here we go. Okay, Christine. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's been interesting listening to everybody, hearing what they got out of those words. Oh, it's so powerful. Um, and I've been reflecting on lots of things. And as you know, I've been working on myself for a long time and it is difficult. It's really, really difficult. Um, and it's different for everybody, but I'm sure it's just as difficult for everyone to do that inner work. Um, and what I, there's a couple of things that have come up even just when you're talking, but something that happened this morning regarding the inner work with a Bible study yesterday, Grace, it was just, it was really amazing. There was a couple of passages that really I've taken on board and and um one of them really puzzled me which one was that oh, i can't remember the name of it but it was right at the beginning um, but it was to do with all souls being saved mm -hmm. and you had a discussion with me about bernie and um really interesting because this morning I got my answer it came in the weirdest way <laughs> really it was just incredible because I realized that he what he what he does in the physical what I do in the spiritual so what he did this morning he said to me oh I've noticed that there's some gaps in the it's like we've got these very long posts on the veranda and at the base of them it's like a reinforcing feet type of thing 
And when we renovated the place, they added new parts to it. And so where the new parts had come on to it, for the uh, passage of time, one of them had come, started to come apart. So he saw that and he said, I'm going to screw it together and paint, paint it so that the water doesn't get in, so it won't get any worse. Basically repair it. And um, when I was watching him, I said, well, all the others are cracking too. So afterwards I noticed that he'd painted the whole lot so that all the cracks, the water couldn't get in. So that, for me, that's a metaphor of um, getting down to the basics and filling up the cracks so the water doesn't get in, the dark side can't get in. And, it was, and you said we work together as a team, and I realised we actually do. Mm. Because what we're really doing is we're, we're building an esoteric Noah's Ark. So in the, um, in the Old Testament, it was the physical boat ark. But what we're building now together as a team is, um, is an esoteric celestial ark. So as we're working deeper with each other, accountable to each other, then we're building that canopy of safety over us and shielding us from what's to come and what's what's he heading our way right now. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you have to have a good foundation for that. Yes. So if there's any leaks in that boat, you'll sink. Yes, and and also the message there too is the promise that God will not destroy the earth anymore by the water. Mm. So even Bernie sealing that, he subconsciously he knew. So if you look at it metaphorically. Mm. So your man is doing his part. Yeah, I realised that. <laughs> <sighs> That's wonderful. That's been a wonderful release for you. Oh. That just happened this morning for you, was it? It was. It was something that I had guess I guess I'd taken taken it on board yesterday. And um I did meditate on it last night. It happened this morning. Mm. <laughs> Woohoo! Fabulous revelation. <laughs> so thank you for um for all that work that you did yesterday with the scriptures, Grace. It was just amazing, really. Yeah. That was really full on, wasn't it? Gosh, that was real intense four hours there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks very much. It was great. Pleasure. Lexi, fabulous. Lexi, did you want to take the mic? Hello. Hi. How's it going? Great. Fabulous. Fabulous. I love that word. <laughs> so, would you like to share yeah, something? Last... Yeah, last night was just really awesome as far as deeper revelation on what the Bible is actually saying because, I, you know, growing up, I seen significance in the bible but was always had a hard time like deciphering the meaning but when you really do shift your perspective and start looking at it from like a your eye or even like intuitively feeling the vibration of the words 
it really it's amazing how it all comes together and how relative it, the, the scriptures are always going to be in our life just the reflection of it in general it is isn't it and also you know just what we unraveled yesterday the teachings we get um taught when we were younger um and also the way they teach the bible they forget the sign the signs of it and also the esoteric the metaphors all of that because it's all that because at the end of the day scriptures is spirit scripture is um it's totally celestial it's non-linear yeah exactly and coming into that knowledge is makes such a shift i feel like being able to take the bible and make it personal to your own journey mm. <clears throat> and it, it is a journey it, it really is a journey and i just think those collections of books are just absolutely wonderful things to be guided by and to the way you live your life giving you clear instructions clear discipline and really um, disciplining in your mindset as well and also developing in yourself and how to do self-transformation has been made way for us already it's just a matter of walking on that path and it's all in there absolutely and walking it with grace makes a big difference yes especially i'm not i don't know what it's like in america lexi but over here you know <clears throat> we now nowadays our neighbors police one another so what happened to love your neighbor yeah exactly i feel like everyone has just gone into that survival mode of like uh, uh myself against everyone else and it's not like a tribe uh, mentality anymore you know like native americans that used to live in this land and, and be a part of what they stood for was you know that tribe mentality that unity that working together that collaboration it's it's gone especially in america honestly it's all very individualized all you know dog eat dog have ever been for himself and i just don't fit in <laughs> at all with that yeah <clears throat> yeah how can you yeah. How can you stand by yourself alone? You're an easy target if you're by yourself. Exactly, and when you have uh, people around you and and you fill into it, all of it really is just love, uh, masked by you know whatever feelings you might be dealing with at the time. Sometimes it could be jealousy, I feel like, or even uh, I, I, for some reason I feel jealousy a lot with, with why people are so like individualized and like all to themselves is and even maybe like greed in some way but i just have such a hard time relating to that type of mindset that i think maybe i'm even like taking kind of wrong because of it but i also find myself isolating because i don't want to be a part of the society that's like that so it's interesting <laughs> yeah <clears throat> Well, William just said, united we stand, divided we fall. Exactly, exactly. And I see that happening all around me. And the, the solution is so simple. It really is. It's, all, it's normally the simple things that's difficult to do, isn't it? It seems that way, yeah. <laughs> Such an uh, oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> yes, catch 22, conundrum yeah absolutely mm. thanks lexi absolutely. anyone else would like to take the mic before warren comes on board he said he's getting heaps of downloads at the moment so he'll be a little bit longer did anyone get any download or any message on that little thing i'll read it again if you want to awaken all of humanity then awaken all of yourself if you want to eliminate the suffering in the world 
then eliminate all that is dark and negative in yourself. Truly, the greatest gift you have to give is that of your own self-transformation. So if anyone else has got to comment on that one, it would be lovely to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Where's to live by? <clears throat> yes. We are a people of transformation. If we're walking on this path, the only choice for ha we have is to transform. And it's amazing what happens to you when you actually have that, um, you really, when you have that real revelation of transformation within, there's so much power in it because there's no effort. Um, how do we live by synchronicity? How do we attract things to us? How do we move in grace and ease? And how do we take all these worries and cares of this world and not be bogged down with it? Mm, so before Warren comes on, does anyone else want to add on to that? It's been a great discussion, actually. Great topic to talk about. We can talk about it for days and years. Hey, Warren, we can hear you. <laughs> you muted yourself again. Alex, did you want to say something? Because you haven't, you've been really quiet lately. You normally like to add things. Would you like to take the floor, Alex, and share a few things? Okay, well, otherwise, we'll just hand it over to you, Warren. Okay, thanks, Grace. How are you, everyone? I've been a busy guy, to put it mildly. So, I was a bit late because I was getting a lot of stuff given to me. So just, can everyone hear me okay? Christine's good, Sheldon. Yeah, I like the stuff you sent me, Sheldon, that Gerald Flurry, I was having a look at some of his stuff and a few others. So, very interesting. I've been amazed how America, I'm finding has had some teachers and pastors who've been really teaching some, you know, the truth. There's a small number of them I'm actually finding at the moment. So it's quite interesting. So there's no doubt that the Father's been preparing people for this time. So I'm going to do what I'm feeling led to do. I'm actually feeling led to open with the Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to pray in English and in Hebrew. And as you know, I don't normally do that, but I'm feeling led to do that today. So just breathe in. I'm going to pray in Hebrew and then give you English. And any of you who know Hebrew, you know, excuse me if my pronunciation isn't perfect. Avinu Shiba Shamayim. 
our Father who art in heaven. Yikarash Semiaka, let your name be sanctified and hallowed. Tavo Malkudyaka, may thy kingdom is being come. Yasar Retzonka, your will is being done. Kumor by Shayam, Kain by Aetz, on earth as it is in the heavens and the higher dimensional realms. Et lekim hokanyu ten lonu hayom. Give us today the bread for this day. Us lak lonu et hovontanyu. And forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our karmic debts. Ka asha salaknu gam anaku la yavanyu. As we've also forgiven our debtors and those who've karmically trespassed or in any way infiltrated or, or done things to us. Via al tibi ainu liai de nisayon. Lead us not into the hands of temptation, into places, into situations that we're not equipped to handle, into places where we'll be led astray or taken off path or moved beyond the walls of our sanctuary where we are kept safe and protected. And our trials and what we experience are only within the realms of what the Father allows. Ki im haldzanyu min hara, and deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil and from the effects of evil around us and the effects of the dark and the effects of the other side of duality that we may stay centered. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so felt very led to do that and I'm discovering more and more how Christ actually always said when he was asked how do we pray he specifically straight away said this is how you pray so there's a definite order and structure in the father's kingdom and some of you who've been coming to our other meetings have been discovering more and more the precision that the sacred word the scrolls are written in they're very exact the meanings are actually very clear but they're kept hidden. And I've shared this with people, with all of you before, but the higher mysteries are kept hidden for a very good reason. So they're kept hidden because we even see right now how technology that's meant to be used for good is being used to cause a lot of harm with humanity. Things like technology, cryptocurrencies, microchipping, all stuff that in theory, 5G, internet, wireless, that can be used to improve speed of information and make a big difference in lives. Things like NLP and things like technology for the brain and for science, which can be used to make to do such good and symbols actually being used in reverse to cause great harm. So one could only imagine if all the technology of the Elohim and the light masters in the hands of Satan and in the hands of those who work in the dark, the damage they could inflict upon humanity. Hence, that's why much is sealed from us until we're ready to hear it and ready to actually take it and use it. Hosea 4 verse 6, my people perish through lack of knowledge, through ignorance. People right now are perishing and being led right into all kinds of stuff through just lack of knowledge and not wanting to know things. So this is why we're heading into this sort of thing. Even now, as we speak, as some of you may have seen on my Facebook, on the 26th of March, there was a patent technology, 060606, that created a cryptocurrency patent for Microsoft that basically will enable the, the system or the beast, basically, to do stuff that's almost incomprehensible. And even yesterday, I've been led into study right now like never before. I have been searching and researching and coming from a deeper level than I've ever gone into in my life. Ever since my mind has been cleared through fasting and through all kinds of stuff and through what they've been doing with me and the implants that have been moved out of me, right now my brain is so clear. I can read stuff. I've realized how much 
mind control implants and things have been limiting in times past. And as I'm reading it and researching and being able to learn more and more stuff, I am being very, I've become more and more sober. To give you an example, the Gates vaccination, which has been tested, which has been planned over the last 10 years, and you can see on my Facebook page, um, if you want to actually look and see it, but over the last 10 years, there has been a systematic plan to indoctrinate and prepare people for this. The vaccination that, that is planned to come in, for example, as an inking technology, that enables you to, that'll actually mean that the result of it could actually be ink on your body, but it shows that you've actually had the vaccination, and which can only be viewed by some kind of scanning or computerized device. And what this basically does is when you think about it, some kind of mark in the physical. So there's no question that the eventual implant will not be something hidden. It will be seen in the physical in some way. And it will like on what you see here. And even from my knowledge of meridians and Chinese meridians, the exact spot on the right hand where it would be most likely to go, which is right between the, the thumb and the second finger, is a very important acup um, pressure point. It goes right through to the brain, right goes through to the mind, it goes through to everything. So what it does is, for example, the nature of this cryptocurrency that's being registered, that if in there, will enable, for example, a full monitoring of brain waves, whether you're in alpha and theta, will be able to view subconscious thoughts, subconscious readings, levels of anxiety, levels of stress, and then basically based on certain actions that are done or thoughts or ways of thinking or being can determine how much currency is actually put into your electronic bank account or even things like fining you for speeding, for example, could just become an automated thing through basically what's happening within you. So this is the ultimate in what's called Satan attempting to be omnipresent and basically become like God, which really right from the beginning in scripture was always what Satan wanted was to be the same as the father which means omnipresent, being able to read everyone and things like that. So there's no question that what we're heading into now, whether this takes six months, a year, three years, five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, or whatever else, there's no question that this is where we, we're basically, what's being put in place and a reality that's being created right now for humanity to walk into. And that is why many like ignorant beasts, as it says in scripture, are just being led towards this destiny, like sheep being led to the slaughter. So it's a serious time. And it's all been written out beforehand. It's all been even shown, if you see on my Facebook page over the last 10 years. 1984, I, I first heard about this technology in 19, basically in the 1980s. In 1984, this has already been unveiled in Europe. So notice that none are exempt and notice that economic livelihood and way of being depends upon it. And I hear people say things like, oh, they'll never do that to me. And no doubt years ago, people were saying they'd never bring cameras into my home. Well, no question now, those cameras will be there. They'll never bring cameras into my community. Well, they now got cameras in New South Wales. So rest assured, people very quickly can find a way to justify something when economic livelihood is at risk, when you still got attachment to your family, when you see you may be okay to starve, but you're watching your kids starve. And if you actually go back, there has been times in history that gave a prelude to this. For example, and again, this is the lack of historical knowledge that people don't actually have, which is why people actually get enslaved. In the book of Daniel, for example, when you read about all the scriptures, from 9, 10, 11, and 12, and, and 8, which gives an exact outcome and meticulous details about the man of sin or the Antichrist and what he will be like. There was a, pre, a prelude before Christ. There was like a foretaste in the same way as Elijah came as a prelude through John the Baptist and will come again once more. The, the final Elijah, the, the final witness of Elijah, the basically there was actually a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, and you have to read the Apocrypha and the book of Josephus. But in 167 with Syria, he persecuted anyone whatsoever that wasn't basically of the Christ or basically anyone in the Israel. And people were basically having to, to worship him and come and actually give him some kind of allegiance. And failure to do so, they would be tortured and boiled in oil. And parents had to watch their kids going through this right in front of them. And there's one story in the Maccabean books where actually 
the, the, the children were just saying to their mum, just be strong, mum. We're going to be fine. We know where we're going. But so just keep in mind that this is talked about being the worst time in history and worse than anything that you've ever seen. And why am I sharing this? Because there's no question that when you read it saying that this will be the worst time in history, that these things are playing out precisely as it actually says. So moving into a time where you move beyond what's called an economic and physical attachment, there's no more important time than ever before as we're experiencing right now. Whereas in days gone by, there's been scriptures taught, there's been things said, people have listened and have gone, yep, and of course, you know, love not the world when Jesus said this. In a way now, humanity is being given the ultimate test. So that's why today I've called it the three phases, because I'm actually going to be showing you today what I call the three ways you can escape what's going to come. And all throughout history, if you actually study the Fox's Book of the Martyrs, if you read Pilgrim's Progress, it was one of the great books in the area where basically, and you read about the preachers and the Great Awakening, like in America, like Charles Finney and Jonathan Edwards, the common message from all the preachers and all the teachers in the early church was flee from the wrath which is to come. That was actually the common message, a kind of turn or burn. Now, in a way, it became a, such a cliche misused thing by religion that many turned away from what, from this kind of stuff. And really, in a way, understandably so, as Charles Finney said, when the church or when people who claim to follow in the light or people who claim to walk in a higher realm start living their life as if they're no different to the rest of the world around them, they said they're actually worse from the world because they know better. They're appalling example and by their actions they are telling the world, you know what, if you basically serve Christ or if you come into that, you can just do what you want. Nothing changes in your life. You can just live your life as if nothing happened. It's not a big deal. You serve Christ and then just keep living everything as if you've ever lived it before. So kind of like what I call a watered down message that teaches people like, you know, there's not a really big price to pay. Whereas Christ did not say that. Christ actually said, when the disciples asked him, he said, narrow is the way to life and broad is the way to destruction. He also, he was very upfront with his disclosure. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went and sold everything he had to buy a pearl of great price. He also told his disciples, in the same way they hated me, they will hate you. And he said, expect it. Embrace it. And he said, be willing to lose everything. He said, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross, crucify yourself to this realm, crucify all your earthly desires, all your earthly dreams, and give it up for the higher work, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, you're going to have to go back to another round. You're going to have to keep living this reality and keep going through it all over again. So he said all this for a good reason to let his disciples know. And the early believers and many of the great awakeners, they were very aware of what was being said. They knew exactly what was being said. They knew what they were up to. And... For example, in the early Roman church, in the early church, if you, all you had to do was turn up once a year, just once, just for two minutes, take a pinch of incense and throw it into a little burner and say, Caesar is Lord. And if you did that and walked away, you could live your life as you wanted to for the rest of the year. You could go on, you could go to church, you could go to any religion, you could worship any God you wanted, you could do anything you wanted, but you just once a year, just for two minutes, had to come down and chuck the incense into the thing and just say the words, Caesar is Lord, and leave. So the point is, there's been plenty of times in history where some kind of allegiance has been required for you to basically an emperor or a lord. And it's just because we're living in a world today where it's almost inconceivable for people that such a world could ever have existed. Not only has it existed, but it's existed many times throughout history many times you read the book of josephus the history book you read the book of daniel you read the maccabean's teachings and every single time humanity has not learnt. the early church got martyred and thrown to lions and got killed because they wouldn't give that pinch of, of, of incense because they knew what they were doing they knew that the moment that they went up and gave caesar that incense they were giving up this, this sovereignty. They were actually acknowledging that Christ was secondary. 
They knew what that meant straight away and refused to do it. And that is why it talks about in Hebrews about the heroes of the faith, those who just refused point blank to basically compromise in any way. And that is why he says here, he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor. In other words, this is going to be the ultimate test of humanity. Because think about when this time comes, what it will actually mean. It will literally mean that you cannot participate in any way of life in society anymore. And you will not be able to get stuff for your kids and anything else. And if you happen to go and steal food for your kids or something else, no doubt there'll be severe, harsh penalties. So this is why Jesus gave plenty of warning to give people an opportunity, as he said in scripture, to not be part of this regime in any way, shape or form. And this is why we also were warned by Paul that we don't wrestle against human beings. We're not fighting Bill Gates. We're not basically fighting some kind of the COVID-19 virus. We're not basically fighting the evil US government hidden in the background. We're not fighting the Jesuit priests who are the Council of Seven who are overseeing the whole thing spiritually. We're not fighting against Warren Buffett. We're not fighting against Hillary and Bill Clinton but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's no doubt in my mind now with what we're teaching and what we're doing that we now are starting to finally get a little bit of attention. And, as soon, and, and I know this from everything that I've learned and when Grace and I worked together and worked with Brian Shaw years ago, he taught us about the occult and various others, that as soon as you start to wake up, they do that. They take action. Personally, even, even two days ago, there was a friend of mine who wanted to talk to me, said, I feel we should talk more in private. My attitude was in all honesty, really hope they can hear what we're saying. I actually really do. I would regard it as an honor because I know that it's the principalities who are listening. They're the ones who listen. So when I'm, when I'm sharing this message today, I'm more sharing, sharing this message to the spirits that are behind this whole thing and dealing with it and breaking through that. Because as we do that, all you will notice is something will shift in you. Something will happen. There may even be an aggravation or an agitation, or you might even start to be feeling sleepy right now, or you'll feel something start in the shift. But this is directly going after the rules of the darkness of this world. And last week we spoke about that with Enoch on End Times. And how Enoch basically was takes, God takes the foolish things of the world. He takes a group of people who really are quite silly and uses them to basically show the world that he, he doesn't depend, the Father doesn't depend upon man or upon man's weakness in any way, shape and form. Absolutely not. Speaking of truth is not about popularity. He took Moses who had a stutter. He took Elijah who lived in the desert wearing sackcloth fed by ravens. He took basically a, a slower speech guy who wasn't particularly liked. He takes someone like Grace from the Philippines who really grew up in a poor village and really no one ever took seriously in her life. He took someone like me who really was just a silly little accountant who was just driven by his own little kind of personal ambitions and things like that. And various others of you who no doubt have never been taken seriously at times, but that's how it works. And Grace made a comment to me today, which I just thought, wow, I love what she said to me. She said, that's why I'm so grateful for those who I never had a father. And that's just a terrible family upbringing because I've got no attachment to the things of this world, Warren, whatsoever. I don't at all. My sole connection is to the father. And I just said, yeah, you're so fortunate, absolutely fortunate. And that one statement Grace made to me today was responsible, which Grace will be pleased to hear, for helping someone today who I was led to call this morning before the webinar, who I spoke to for ages. A girl who's been coming the night to the Holy Cross and she actually said how she'd never gotten over the fact that, you know, she'd never really had a father. And I just, and I told her what Grace said to me today and she goes, my gosh, that just changes the way I see everything. I said, yeah. So your statement today, Grace, has already had an impact. This is why speaking your truth, you can change, we can literally, it doesn't take many people. God told, basically told Abraham, if just 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah were righteous, he would have spared the whole city. Doesn't take many people to spare West Australia, to spare your city. Doesn't take many at all to take your region. 
takes very few. We shared last week about three distinct orders, the order of Christ, the order of Melchizedek, and the order of Enoch, the teachers, the priesthood, the saviors. That's annoying. I just want to fix that up. Saw that. So, Bible references. We've got this here, which I mentioned about Enoch. He was translated because he pleased God. He moved into the light body. He ascended. He did not even taste death. Hebrews 11 said, how did he do it? By faith. So by faith, he was translated to not basically taste death. He was not found. That's since happened to other people. Annalise Scarron in the Mormon church in 1952 went, miss went missing. She was not found. And over the next 35 years, on and off, people would report meeting her. She'd come and teach them the higher principles of the kingdom and she'd just disappear. Grace in 1992 will tell you how, or 91 or 92, where she met this man and she felt led to pick up a hitchhiker, which she'd never normally meet. The guy just told her to take her to the Bible study, she went there, he shared a few things. And then basically, when she dropped him off at the airport, he disappeared right in front of her. Why Hebrews 13 said, be very careful how you deal with people because for all you know, you might be dealing with an angel. There's a true situation where a man actually turned up at a church run by a very wealthy pastor, went and sat in the front, um, row the pastor was horrified because the man was dressed really poor he looked poor he thought this does not look good for our church so he very he asked the man if he could just move to the back of this of the, of the church because he just said this was where the leaders of the church sat and the man went with a very humiliated look and sat at the back of the church and everyone kind of ignored this man and were kind of relieved this man was at the back of the church but one little girl kept looking at him and feeling drawn to him and she said, Mum, we've got to help him. We can't just leave him like that. That's not what Jesus would do. So finally, her mum reluctantly said, OK, I'll, we'll talk to him after the service. And they did. And the man was very grateful that she spoke to him. And a little girl just said, you know, please, can you come to our house for dinner? Mum, can you let him come? I want to make sure he gets some food. So her mum said, OK, sure. So the man came back to their house and was teaching them about some stuff. And they felt the authority. And as they blessed the food, he looked at them and smiled and then vanished. And of course, they realized they'd been entertaining an angel or possibly even Christ himself. So you just don't know. So William, yeah, you just do not know who you're speaking to. That's why Enoch wrote his books dedicated to humanity. That's why his books went hidden for hundreds of years. To see who was going to search them. To see why in the church, in the false religions of light we're in today, have hidden, will not you know, recognize his books and see them as kind of not inspired books. The Book of Moses, the Mormon Church, kind of despised. And although some of their stuff, of course, I'm not led towards, some of them was definitely given to, to, to Joseph Smith directly from the father, and he talks about that in the Keys of Enoch. So there's so much here that Enoch came to deliver as a separate order. And so much of the early church highly revered the Book of Enoch. And you may remember last week I shared about how this was addressed specifically to those living in the day of the Great Tribulation the judgment of the wicked and the godless. And basically, clearly it was said, this is not, was not for the elect. This is actually to redeem the elect. This is to actually take the, to judge the wicked and the godless. That's why when Sammy even made a statement, she goes, she was up, she was crying a bit. I said, well, are you okay? And she goes, I just really feel for women giving birth right now in these times, you know, in pregnancy, like woe to them for what they're bringing in. I said, yes. I said, he goes, how do you feel about that? I said, well, all I know is that karmically, whatever these, these people have been up to in their past, um, they've certainly done some pretty bad stuff because they're coming in to experience it right now. She goes, that, that's a different way of looking at it. I said, yeah. And I said, some others have chosen to come here to be indigos, to help redeem and be part of this redemption process. So basically what we're in right now is a day of the judgment of the great tribulation a day when the wicked and the godless and those who consistently have disobeyed karmic law and continued lifetime after lifetime, as Yogananda says, and as J.J. Hertak says, one of the keys of Enoch, to ignore and deliberately resist the message, ignore over and over again, and put self-serving first and foremost, and put living the things of this earth as the highest priority over and over and over and over again. This is now the final moment to say, this time either you stop doing it, or basically you start living your life properly. And if you read John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, this was how he used to share at the time. This was the kind of message he shared. 
to flee from the wrath to come. He was put in prison for it because at the time it was illegal to preach the gospel or any kind of teaching other than what was actually allowed by government licensing system. The same thing I see they're starting to bring in in parts of the world. You will find, if you just think about the last three months of what's happened, two months, churches were ordered back to their home and ran carrying back into their homes. That shows now who is Lord of the churches, it's Satan. But it's kind of been a deliberate thing to show that the, the churches, who's their Lord, and that's the government, that's Satan. That's now who they're serving. And, whether, and most of them would be outraged to even hear this treatment because most of them will not admit that truth. But the fact that they chose to go running in to their, to their houses, or at least not speak out about it in some way. There were some who have in America who got out straight out there and ignored it completely. And I've got a bit of time for those people, but at least they got out there and said, well, no, we're not gonna have the government telling us what to do like this. This is not how this works. So the whole point is, is that we're living in times that are very, very sobering. And when you read the awakening preachers like Finney and Edwards, um, if you really want to see why these, why, these, why these cities and these parts of America experienced extraordinary awakenings, when you read about them, you'd almost think it wasn't possible. But what happened in America, the awakenings that happened in that, in that country, in that period, have to be almost seen or read to be believed. Whole cities literally in droves were just, were literally, renouncing their way of living. Pubs were shutting down, not because there's a lockdown, but people didn't want to go there anymore. People just simply wanted to go and just get straight down to the churches. They wanted to go and actually sing. They wanted to go and they wanted to read the scriptures. They, they wanted to go and live their lives in service of humanity. And, but when you read the messages of, of especially probably the main leader of the Great Awakening, who I've just about read everything I can find, Charles Finney, absolutely strong messages strong strong messages which he would he would give and he would just tell the people straight out he'd say you cannot just live your life as you choose to and in fact he would even go as far as to say and if you're living your life in some kind of poverty mentality that in itself goes against scripture he said people who follow christ he said should be the most prosperous he said should be the most blessed people and uh, because their wealth is not used for themselves. It's not used basically for their own personal gain. They live well, they dress well, they eat well, they look, they look good because they're doing it for a higher purpose and a higher cause. He used to tell parents, he said, if your children, he said, are turned away from, from the truth and they're living kind of, as he calls, reprobate lives, he said, there's a, there's a promise in scripture. He said, just simply say, they are, they, are, they are basically here to serve Christ. Their lives will sort out. And you have a promise directly that this will happen. So we're living in these times where, where a strong message has got to be heard. And basically for people to come back and escape these days which are to come. Because believe you me, in the midst of these dark days ahead, you're talking about the most glorious things happening at the same time because things do work in contrary motion or duality. So you're seeing also you will see awakenings across this planet and across places that will have to be seen to be believed. In fact, in 2006, when I was in my car and Charles Finney appeared to me in my car and spoke to me and I was weeping like a baby because I'd read everything about him and he spoke to me and I felt so much love from him. And I even just said to him, it is my, my whole desire, I said, to see the awakenings that you saw in America happen in, my, in, in this world today. And he just kept me kind of, was, was smiling and all he kept saying is what I saw in my day won't even come close to what you will see in your day. It's like kindergarten. He said, what you are seeing is a reformation that will sweep, that will sweep your, your land, that will sweep your earth. And I, I got vi visions and glimpses of it. And I was told about what was to come. Some of it, I still can hardly share it because it was so phenomenal what I saw. I've, had, I've been having to wait until the time when I've been allowed to share it fully and it hasn't quite come yet. But let's just say what I saw was a reformation is almost hard to fathom, but you will see in this earth. So this is what this is. This, is a, this, this, this time that's coming ahead is not a time for those who've chosen to be part of the elect and chosen to, to give their lives for the for higher kingdom of heaven, for the higher work. In fact, quite the opposite. This is the time of the greatest redemption, the greatest change, and the greatest cleanup operation that you're ever going to see. So that's why today 
we're going for the three phases. And yeah, Sam, my spirit feels that so strongly right now. Oh yeah, look, my fire is, my spirit is burning right now. As you can probably see, I'm seeing all this un unfold me. I'm having to hold back the tears, this whole message so far. Because I literally am feeling and seeing the glory of God. And I've been just all day. I've been feeling it build and build and build and build. And this is why today, this is the message I've been given to give is about the great tribulation, the purpose, and who is going to be caught in this. So let's just go first to Jeremiah 30. This was the first scripture that I was actually given. Hmm, I cannot get this to work right now. Let me just take okay gotcha okay so jeremiah 30 so notice here that it always it always starts positively so the first thing that that, that, the, that yahweh the father promised is that he would restore the captivity now for those of you who don't know the old testament history basically what happened was the original adamic seed that was put on earth that was actually meant to be a separate community from the ungodliness and the crap and the child sacrifice and the murders and the normal stuff that was going on on the planet from the behavior of the archons they were meant to live a different distinct lives and because they didn't they were carried off into captivity or into slavery and handed over to these foreign nations and this didn't happen for any other reason than the father actually told him, I'm doing this, not you. You know, this is not the enemy doing it. I'm doing it. And Grace reminded me this morning in Job that Satan couldn't actually do anything until he'd, with, 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 the, with the elect until he'd first gone through the father. So although Satan can do whatever he wants with those who serve him, those who are part of the elect, he can't touch you unless he's gone through the father and basically you're playing up. And so he said, I will bring back the captivity and I will return him to the land. In other words, I will basically sort this whole thing out and take people out of slavery. But he then says, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. And this was the exact scripture that I was given six weeks ago, just before this lockdown started. It said, ask now, and see whether a man travails of child. Why do I see every man with his hand on his loins and a woman in travail and all faces turn to paleness? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. it. Is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So this was the word I was given, Jacob's trouble. And Jacob, of course, was the father of the 12 tribes. His name was changed to Israel. So he's like the father or prototype of Israel, the Israel of God, the higher um, elect seed. Israel means of kind of means prevail with God. So it's even the time of Jacob. Now, this is going a bit deeper, but for now I'll just I'll just say this, even though you might not understand it, but I'll say it so it goes in. Jacob and Israel are too distinct, even though they're one and the same, they're distinct, because Jacob was who Israel was before for prevailing with God. In other words, while Jacob was still a little bit of a swindler, a bit of a rogue, basically he was called Jacob. Once he prevailed with God and stopped being a swindler, he became Israel. So Jacob's trouble is really a bit of a clue. In other words, notice how God always describes himself as of Israel. But here he calls him Jacob, because in other words, those who are still attached to the 3D, it's their time of trouble. Those who are part of my elect children, but who are still attached to this 3D and haven't let go of it, basically will go through purging in some way to free them from the 3D. And you'll see these clues all the way through the sacred writings, which kind of show that those who aren't attached to the 3D, this, this isn't for them. In other words, this time is not for you. In a way, you've been through your tribulation already. And Grace and I were talking about what we've been through the last 25 years. In a way, you've been through your tribulation already. And for both of you, because to become unattached to the world, it's not exactly easy when you're living in a world where your whole status and worth is determined by your looks, by whether you're a celebrity, by whether you're on Instagram, how much money you've got, by all kinds of things. To actually detach from that, and even by your family, about your kids, 
about what your kids like in school, about your kids' health, about you know when your kids are being bullied by, by whatever else. When all these kind of like distractions are around you, it's very, very difficult to not be attached to, this, to, this, to the things of this world. So that's why it's almost inconceivable for people when Christ, to even for, for what Christ says, which is to actually say that you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven unless basically, like he said, it's narrow is the way. He then goes on to say other things like, like a pearl of great price where you have to give up everything and where he told his disciples, you must take up your cross and follow me. And people go, that's just impossible. So they start finding ways to water it down. And I'll admit, I've done that in times past. You start to think of ways of saying, well, maybe he didn't really mean that. That's kind of just some old archaic religious kind of idea. So uh, he kind of said you could, you know, you just, you just have to be a reasonably okay kind of a guy or girl. And... As long as you're reasonably okay and you're not going around doing this stuff and you know if you're going and doing x and doing y and doing z and yeah if you go and kind of tuck in and go and get a few you know needles because the government says you've got to get it and it's got an implant or whatever else well you know it's kind of like i'm sure god understands so eventually we start watering down higher truths and, and it sounds really logical and sounds really reasonable but in actual fact, this is the reason why, time after time after time, we continue to fall back and reincarnate and reincarnate and in a way stay trapped in this prison vibration. And that is why I said it's the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, those who are basically still living attached to the 3D and the things of it. Now, I will throw in there, but Jesus never said, for example, but to not be attached to the 3D, that means, right, okay, fine. You know, you can go and kind of ignore your family, ignore all of this. No, he never said that. You will see that when he was basically dying on the cross, he wanted to make sure his mum was taken care of. He was very mindful of that. But, but when his family came, for example, and tried to oppose his call, he said, well, you aren't my family. He said, my family are those who do the will of God. Now, imagine the shock that would have been for his family. Imagine you saying to your mum or dad, which I've kind of done before, and Grace has seen it and chuckled, well, you're not my family. I mean, I don't regard you as my family because if you're not doing the higher will in align with my path, you aren't my family. That's basically what Jesus was saying. And if you also read Jesus, he lived quite well. He wasn't attached to wealth. He didn't own any for himself because he just chose not to, but he lived abundantly. He had very wealthy people look after him. He wasn't in any way in the system of his day. So, so no point anywhere does it say, don't, don't live well. Smith Wigglesworth, for example, he used to say, the great healer, he would say, the Lord's servant gets looked after by the, king, by, the, by, by, the, by the father himself. The day I don't have three brand new suits and can't travel first class in a carriage, I'm quitting ministry and I'm going back to plumbing because I'm clearly out of God's purpose. And Wigglesworth, his whole life, lived very abundantly without any issue Charles Finney said the same thing. So this is more about a change in the heart. And sometimes, yes, for a time, you are called to let go of your attachments. Sometimes there was a time where you are called out openly to let go of these things because if you're attached to them. That was why when the rich man came to Jesus and said, how do I actually, you know, inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at him and said, give up all you have, sell it all, give it to the poor, and then follow me. He saw that because he knew of that man, but that man was completely attached to his wealth and the man couldn't do it. I know at one stage when I had my encounter with the Council of Nine, I can remember in 2018 for the first time in my life, I just actually could say my m money means nothing to me. I'll, I'll happily live all my life and have no business, have nothing. In fact, I said I, I literally gave up everything in my heart and it was easy to do. And since I've done that, especially over the last little while, after a period of time, life was interesting. I have just noticed how abundantly now things are opening up. And because you know, I can honestly tell you right now, it, it, I just think, you know what? It's so meaningless, all this kind of stuff and any kind of enslavement. So this is what he said about the day of Jacob's trouble. To test all those. Then when you read about this time as well, when you go to the scroll of Daniel, and read master, you know, one of the great prophets. And he says, 
Michael, one of the four archangels who looks after the children of the people. And then he says those chilling words, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone that to be found written in the book. So there's a promise of deliverance, but there's going to be a time of great trouble. So it's spelt out black and white very, very clearly. When you read as well, Revelation 2. And this is a particular warning to those who've been in the Babylonian system in some way, or in the church system in some way. He goes on to say this in, from verse 8, and he talks about the church of fire at Tyra. And he gave them a warning because they were tolerating Jezebel. And he calls them a prophetess. In other words, they were tolerating the, the what's called carnal or lower energy forms. They were, they were letting things go. They weren't speaking their truth. They were allowing themselves to get caught up in things that they weren't meant to. So, warning given, and he says this. I will basically cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of her deeds, and I will kill her children with death. So it's a pretty chilling kind of like promise. But those who are compromising and haven't let go of, of the things of the earth and are still caught up with the false system and false spirit guides and things like that, the, the reward for doing that is to go into great tribulation and says, I will kill her children with death, and then the churches will know. But I am here who searches the brains and the hearts. But then he says, but to the rest of you who refuse to know the depths of Satan, which is very interesting ways, I will put upon you no other burden. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. In other words, stand your ground against this false spirit guides and this false stuff and this stuff that's teaching you to go back into the 3D. And he that overcomes and keeps my work to the end, I will give power over the nations. This is a prelude to what I'll be sharing a little bit more on today. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Now keep in mind that just about everything that's said in the New Testament is quoting from the Old. So all of this is interpreted quite easily in the Old Testament. So numerous times, if you have an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying. In other words, for those of you who've got a spiritual ear, listen to what's being said and understand what's being said. And then when you want to go further, you've got Revelation 3, which is even further. Next level. So there's a little warning about people being killed with death. Now have a look at this one. This is talks to the church of Philadelphia, who it says, the only one of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, but he does not rebuke them at all. He actually says to them, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it. You have a little strength, you've kept my word, I've not denied my name. In other words, you have stood firm and you have not backed off from what you're doing and you stood truthful and you stood firm right to the end and I am rewarding you accordingly. So he says, because you've kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which will come upon the world to test those that dwell upon the earth. So you can see it again. There's another reference to it. There's another reference to this. So this hour of temptation. Luke 21. So it's been constantly spoken about. He talks about that this time will be a snare to those who dwell upon the earth. He says, watch and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So over and over and over and over and over and over again. Warnings are given. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life. So now, so you can see this here now. Exciting stuff. So really, 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 really exciting stuff. So he warns you, but when you then go ahead and read the book of Enoch, and I'll just quickly go back into that one there. As you can see, I've been busy.
So Enoch. Oh. Must have missed one. Let's have a look. Hmm. Interesting. Hopefully it's still there. Sacredtext.com. Maybe it's gone. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, I think it may be this one here. Hmm, it's gone down. Okay. Sitting here. Yeah, I don't like this translation as much, but basically what it says here is the word of the blessing of Enoch, how he blessed the elect and righteous who were to exist in the day of tribulation, is the actual one and the other one, rejecting all the wicked and ungodly. And many said, from them I heard and understood that this was not this generation, but in generation to come, a distant period on account of the elect. And when you read this through, it's very clear that he will give peace, preserve the elect, and take care of them and bless them. So in other words, it's just not for those who are walking in the right place at all, in any way, shape or form. So the Great Tribulation is also spoken about in Revelation 7. So this is just before it's about to start, after the seals have been getting broken. So what you're seeing here is, first of all, look at this. Do not hurt the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we seal the servant of God in their foreheads. So, as well as the mark of the beast, notice that there was a mark of God, which means basically you're off limits. I won't go into this now, but if you read Ezekiel 9, Ezekiel chapter 9, you will also see about this seal or mark of God. So, in other words, understand if you're one of the ones that have that mark, they can't touch you. You're off limits. You could literally have demonic beings come running into your community, killing people around you, and you could be watching in horror, and they just look at you and kind of smile and then leave you alone. That's basically what they're saying. They cannot touch. And if you read Job chapter one, you will see that very clearly. Job, Satan was not allowed to touch Job until. He'd gone through the father first. That's why I know that I can't be touched unless I've been a naughty boy. And, by, and if I get any signs of it, I'm moving my ass quickly. Now here, what it says he saw was he then saw a great multitude, which no man could number of all these people standing before the Lord, clothed with robes, crying salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne. So they're saying, well, who are these guys? And he said, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne dwells among them. and shall hunger no more, thirst no more, nor the sun shall light. For the lamb shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water and wipe all tears from their eyes. I always love that scripture. In other words, Christ is their shepherd. So you can see there the great tribulation mentioned again in the redemption. So what's the purpose of it? <clears throat> Revelation 3, which I said to test all those who dwell upon the earth. So in other words, if you dwell upon the earth, and something that especially Christine, Natasha, and those who have been coming to Grace's other Bible studies, and Lexi and Fiona, is that the scriptures, you've got to actually read exactly what it says. And I let this as a lawyer, but you've got to actually read what things say, not what you think they're saying. And this is how I've managed to escape many ungodly or horrible laws, by actually reading what the law says, not what I think it said. So to test all those who dwell upon the earth. So there's a secret to dwell upon the earth. So you might, for example, even do something like this for a bit of fun. This is my little strong concordance I've been getting into lately. 
So I'll just copy that, put it over here. And I'm, I know what the word actually means, but you probably would even find, if you go here, So if you go further, so dwell, we'll find that there, for example, it's a verb to settle, who dwell in the earth, who settled in the earth, who have to settle, to pervade, in other words, caught up in the earth. God is to dwell in his temple, always present. In other words, those who are present or dwelling in the earth. Doesn't that give you some enlightenment, everyone? To house permanently. In other words, you've settled yourself and you've made the earth your home. So all those who've chosen to do that, you will be tested. You can see the power of when you do this. So it's a kind of a bit of an eye opener, isn't it? So dwell to 7.30. I have settled. Made it their permanent home. So if that's what you've done, or if you know people who've done that, that's, you are going to be part of that testing to make sure you make a choice. So at least you make a choice one way or the other. Christ was very clear when he said to his people, he said, you're either for me or against me, he says. In other words, there's not a third middle ground that says, well, I sit on the fence. Christ said you either serve Satan or you serve Christ. There's not actually a middle ground. Joshua said to the people, choose this day whom you serve. Elijah said the same, choose this day Baal or Christ. Isn't it interesting, everyone, when you look at that strong, who's so found that's really enlightening just by seeing the meaning of the word. That's straight from the Greek. So when we look at the Strong's, we're actually getting the exact Greek meaning of the word. So you actually see it. Yeah, Christine, yeah. So you can actually see everything is written with meaning and written with intention. So does everyone will be caught? Well, no. Again, you've got to read the codes and the hidden messages. Luke 21 said, pray that you may be counted worthy to escape. Revelation 3 is very important. I showed you that one. I will keep you from that hour. So that's here. I will keep you from that hour. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from that hour. In other words, you won't go through that. So there's very clearly some people who will not go through that. There is a way of escape. So what are the ways of escaping? This is what I call the three phases. There's two ways of escape and three ways of being redeemed. There's a difference. Or redemption. So the two different things. Escape means you don't go through it in the first place or you're protected from it. Redemption means you come out of it, okay? So when you read it, there's, there's three different things happening. And Revelation 12 is what we're going to be looking at because this actually maps this out quite nicely. The first way is what I call the path of Enoch. So let's have a look at Revelation 12. I had it.
Okay. Hmm. It comes straight up. Let's see if this comes up. Hmm. Just bear with me, everyone. I just want to get this up. Okay. Here we are. Bingo, got it. Yep, so we got it here that when you read the book of Enoch, and what actually happened was you'll read here that when Enoch actually taught them, and he said he called his people Zion, those who listened. They were one heart, one mind that dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. And all throughout scriptures, you'll see this. It says that Zion and I are blessed. This is what the Father said all through scriptures, that Mount Zion. And Enoch continued his preaching, but he built a city that was called the city of holiness that was Zion. And then he said, surely Zion shall dwell in safety forever. And it came to pass that the Lord showed Enoch, and behold, Zion was taken into heaven. And that was how the first ascended city came about. So they were taken into heaven. And so in other words, this was the first way. Enoch, as you may remember in Genesis 5 and in Hebrews 11, says that he would be taken into the heavens. It actually said that Enoch was translated. So the first path is what's called a rapture or a great ascension, where you basically move into some kind of light body and where you move beyond. In other words, you clear your whole body, you clear your soul, you clear your oversoul. Annalise Scarron, she talks about this in her, in her books, like You Are Gods is one of her books. Um, she basically says that escaping death, she said, is what Christ said. He says in, in John 11, and some of you who heard Grace's teaching on resurrection, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will never die. And John, as I've taught, got that. The Mormon church, for example, teach that John never died and that John actually was translated, which is personally I am absolutely certain of. But he took Jesus seriously. Annalise Scarron talks about this as well, how she basically, in 1952, she disappeared and was seen for 35 years. In another book called The Heaven and the Hereafter, in this one here, um, written by Sadhu Sudar Singh, who talks about his experiences when he actually met with... Um, a master in the Himalayas who was 300 years old, who would moved into light body and was choosing to stay in his physical body to pray and serve the people on earth. But he was over 300 years old. So many of these Indian yogis around Tibet, Himalayas and places like that, Babaji, people like that. You'll, so that's, they talk about this path where Jesus, for example, when you even read what he says. So in John 3, for example, this is like the first path. And for some of you, you will feel straight away, this is your path. And Jesus, of course, made the words, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Jesus made an interesting comment, which Annalise Scarron, when she taught, after she had basically moved into light body, when she wrote her book and she taught people, what she actually said was she quoted this exact scripture here. When she says this here, she goes, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So unless you're born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, the wind blows where it lists and you hear the sound, but you can't tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone born of the spirit. Annalise Scarron says that basically, notice the hidden clue to what Christ is saying there. He says, you see the wind, you hear the wind, but you don't actually see it. He said, likewise, that's giving you a clue as to the kind of body that a light body is. You see, you hear, you get senses, but just like that, you're here and you're gone. You're everywhere. In other words, you're not constrained by the physical body. 
you're not constrained by time and space. So um, Anna Lee, um, Anna Ben Lee, L-E-E, -E, Scarin, S-K-A-R-I-N. So you can see that here. So then when you read this scripture here, there was a great wonder in heaven and this whole scripture, I could just do this alone. But now let's kind of not go too much into this woman other than say, she is a kind of type of Israel or the Israel of God, which is the, the people of God. Those who are, and you get that little clue from Genesis 37. Because in Genesis 37, Joseph, um, when Joseph had his dream, he actually said that he saw the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, because he was a 12th star bowing before him. And straight away, Jacob, his father, rebuked him and said, are you saying that your mother, your father, and your brothers will all bow down to you? In other words, he knew straight away, this is always talking about Israel. So the woman in some way is referring to the Israel of God or the higher daughter of Zion, the Israel of God. So notice that she's prevailing in birth and pining to be delivered. In other words, she's about to give birth to a whole new seed or beings of people or something that's completely different to anything that's been seen before. And the dragon knows this is his greatest threat because the dragon, some of you who've been involved would know, but I've taught with Satanism, they'll go first for you, then for those around you, then for those around those. In other words, they go in order. So the dragon knew, but his greatest threat wasn't actually the woman. And the woman basically, the true divine feminine knows who they really are. And when I was speaking to Yvonne, Toby's ex-wife, she said, I know, she said, we're meant to hold the sacred space and hold the energy and open the portals for the divine masculine to step up and be the doers and bring the changes. And this was why Deborah had to basically judge Israel, but Deborah never led a revolution. She stepped up and she told Barak, you got to go and Judges 4. So if you read Judges 4, she held the space and then said to the men, you get out, Barak, you lead this army. It's your job. You are the divine masculine. You lead this. I will create the spaces. I will create the energy. We will break the powers of darkness for you to go in there. But you have to go in and do this work. So you've got here the sacred feminine, the woman. The dragon, although he knows this woman's a problem, the woman isn't his greatest concern. His concern is the, is the man-child or what's about to come out of this woman. Something that Romans 8 gives you a clue when Romans 8 verse 18 says that the whole earth, Mother Earth, is groaning in the whole of creation waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, there was a groaning of earth waiting for what's called the saviors or deliverers that would be sent to sort out this fucking mess. And to give you a little bit of a clue as to the saviors and the fact that there would be saviors that would be sent to sort this out which the dragon knows and the occult know very well, but have hidden very well from the church. And has been, and I believe the father has been the one that's hidden it. So it doesn't get tampered with. You will see this in Micah chapter five, which I mentioned last week, a very important prophecy because this also refers to that woman. So basically after Christ being smit on the cheek, which happened at the cross, and after he came out of Bethlehem, it says he will then give up his people, which he's done. Uh, but notice these critical little clues. And remember, the scripture just leaves you clues and you've got to work it out. Until the time that she which travails is brought forth. And then there's a very curious statement. The remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So you see all these little bits and pieces here. The remnant of his brethren. Whose brethren? Well, the reading of it, he. In other words, there's other Christs or saviors that would come. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return. In other words, the saviors will come back to the people to deliver them. And from there, the millennium, the golden age would come in. And he will be great all to the ends of the earth. And that's when you got that scripture I shared last week. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into a land. In other words, when the enemy comes after the people of God, 
We will raise up like a flood, as Isaiah 59 says, and raise up a standard against him. Seven shepherds and eight principal men, which we saw fulfilled last week. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod. They will deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples a due from the Lord that tarries not for man. There will be like a lion among the beasts of the forest. In other words, there will be serious ass kickers. There will be like nothing. This, this little group of people, this remnant, these sons of God that the devil that it says a dragon is waiting to destroy. And this is why. Because he knows these guys will literally kick his ass and eat him for breakfast and they will beat him so easily. And he, and he knows that the only way to stop that is he has to get him before he gets in. They have to stop this remnant from arising. That is why anyone in any way who's part of this very small elect remnant, and that's for the father to reveal who they are, have been absolutely targeted from their birth and have been well and truly hidden because it says, your hand shall be upon your adversaries and your enemies shall be cut off. In other words, it will be a whitewash, absolute whitewash. It'll be a full deliverance. So there's all these little things here that you can see here. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. Notice who is returning to, not to the people of the world, to those who dwell upon the earth. Those who dwell upon the earth have got a different destiny ahead of them, which you'll see. I'm talking about the first group of people. You've then got to go to Obadiah. And like I said, what I'm doing right now is putting this in your spirit. Some of you will understand this straight away. Some of you will get the big picture, but won't quite get it. But that's okay. This is building things in position. But upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. In other words, notice that Mount Zion, that place where it says ascended into heaven, in other words, in that higher realm, that higher oversoul, that higher Christ avatar, being in that higher light body, shall there be deliverance and there shall be holiness. Holiness means separation. In other words, no attachment to karma, no attachment to the things of the earth. And notice this little gem. This is the great wealth transfer. The house of Jacob shall take their possessions. In other words, those who are still on this earth physically, but have submitted themselves and have gone through the great tribulation and they've submitted themselves to the Father shall take their possessions. In other words, they'll basically clean out their finances and clean up the wealth and you'll see a massive transfer in business, wealth, property, everything. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau, the stubble. The house of Esau has been the financial enemy of the people of Yahweh pretty much since time, in, since early on. That's a whole different teaching. But this is where the bankers come out of, where the Khazarian Rothschilds, all that. And notice this, they of the south. And as Grace would tell you, the queen of the south, Jesus said, shall rise in the judgment and condemn the queen of the south. So this should get you excited, Grace, because they of the south shall take the mountain of Esau. In other words, clean out the city of London, take the banks, take the system, take it right out from under their feet, shall take out the Philistines, shall possess the fields of Ephraim. In other words, shall take the land and completely take the wealth. A reformation that you cannot comprehend. This is giving you a sneak preview. A reformation that looks as impossible as it sounds, but will happen. Before your eyes, with or without you. And the captivity of the host, in other words, even those who've been slaves previously, shall take everything. Those who built these statues to Moloch, everything. They shall take the cities of the south. In other words, Australia shall turn into a land of abundance, a land completely under the canopy and the glory of God. And here's the verse I wanted to lead you to. And saviors shall come on Mount Zion. And this is what we're talking about the remnant of Christ's brethren, a specific group of people under Christ to in the office of the Christ coming specifically to judge the Mount of Esau and rule and reign and sort out his shit. That's what, now you can get a little bit of an insight why the jagged dragon is shitting himself and wants to take out this child before he comes. So much so, but he even threw out a third part of the stars of heaven. In other words, basically, of angels to work with him to do whatever it took to devour her child as soon as it was born. 
and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations of a rod of iron and look what happened her child was caught up to god and to his throne so here's the first group so let's just go into that one a little bit so as i mentioned here the great ascension and we'll come back to this little part here so the child the child of the woman so this is giving you a bit of an insight the man child to rule and shepherd the nations left babylon babylon long ago walk with the lamb like enoch pure is caught up to god in his shame now to, to, to prove this to you man not the word man child man the strong concordance nine times is a male it's been it's in it's, it's that same word is used nine times in the new testament and every time it was a male so no question this is not a female this is divine masculine child 5207 is also a child masculine noun the same word used in the son of son of man son of god son of david only begotten son used for adam and christ so this is a man christ a man a kind of man son of man a man christ who will rule with a rod of iron now that same words that's used about a rod of iron people think straight away of ass kicking and yes there was an ass kicking but it's actually translated also as a shepherd's rod in other words will shepherd the people so it's going to be a shepherd in other words it's the the saviors are not just ass kickers they're shepherds for the people of god it says about king david that king david was a shepherd so king david in psalm 23 king david basically talks about the lord as a shepherd so in other words it's like a shepherd nurture to care to protect that's what a shepherd does nurture care and protect against wolves so this is basically what you're seeing here so the rod of discipline in other words the saviors and judges they're a different different group of people they're pure they're ass kickers but they're shepherds for the people basically for, for basically the, the flock of christ and you can see clues to this it's a beautiful beautiful scripture when you think about this it's a beautiful scripture and someone's commented your rod and your staff come me yeah it's a beautiful scripture and you get a little bit of a clue when you go in here so when it's talking about this rod of iron where else is this referred to it's referred to and remember the scripture always interprets itself so psalm 23 your rod and your staff comfort me and here's this one here this is what the lord told christ you are my son this day i've forgotten you ask of me and i'll give you the nations for your inheritance the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession you will break them with a rod of iron you'll dash them in pieces like a pot of vessels vessels in other words the nations will be judged and be wiped out those who are dwelling in the earth and not serving christ and working against the higher good of humanity they will be judged for their actions this is what it's saying here very clearly you then go a little bit further and you'll see it also mentioned in revelation 2. and he that overcomes and keeps my works to the end to him will i give power over the nations he shall rule them for a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers even as i received to my father so again you can see now it's actually referring it's not just to jesus who was also given that promise so he was the first fruits it's, it says in hebrews he's the first fruits of his brethren in other words there's more there's other words there's other christ in the office of the christ now most churches would just say i've just made the most heretical statement possible but this is what the keys of enoch shows the scriptures say this Annalise Garin got excommunicated from the Mormon church three days before her ascension, before she translated, because she taught, you are gods, from Psalm, 80, from Psalm 82. Because Psalm 82 says, did I not say you're all gods? And Jesus quoted that. In other words, you are all gods. That's what he said. You're all a race of gods. I'll just take that and that. So yes masculine to protect so basically yes you're all gods Let's see if i can just make that so yes yeah, so all you're all gods with what she said 
And Jesus quoted that. So the man child here, you've got this here. So what do the sons of God really do? Well, you can see this here, what a shepherd does. David says, your rod and your staff comfort me. You also see in Revelation 19, the same thing here. This is talking about the judgment, the fact that Christ coming to judge the nations. A new vesture, the armors in heaven. In other words, those who are part of that first ascension, the first phase, these are the ones who've moved into light body, the divine masculine, the divine warriors, the noble warriors, the ones. And keep in mind in saying that, I don't know, I'm sure there'll be some, some feminine in there too, but who have been given and to anoint and step into that masculine power. So there's a divine feminine, divine masculine, it says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So again, you see this coming up here now. And what does it say? What it says about this shepherd? It says that he who rules over men must be just in the fear of God. He shall be as the light of the morning when the sun rises, as the tender grass of the dew, an everlasting covenant. In other words, a shepherd. Bringing the morning to the people, bringing joy, bringing the sun, bringing light, bringing gladness. Isaiah 32 gives you another bit of a taste about this and about this time. A king shall reign in righteousness, princes shall rule in judgment. And this is where the divine masculine and the divine feminine together. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, as rivers of water in a dry place as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. This is what the masculine, divine masculine do. You step up to be shepherds, but being a shepherd means if a wolf is coming for the people, you attack, you go after it. When you see people coming in to hurt the, the flock and force people into a microchip and hurt their children, the divine masculine says you will not, basically, as Gandalf said in Lord of the Rings, you will not pass. You want to pass, you're coming through me. I think for me, one of, the, one of my favorite moments of my life that happened to me was the other week when I put myself in the firing line, when I actually, to get people out there to anoint those high places, because I knew that Satan would attack severely. So it was why I told everyone to go and delegate an authority. And I just said to the party, you better protect me, because I'm putting myself right in the middle and, and they can all come at me, every one of them, send the whole lot of them at me. And, he, and they certainly came at me this week. And I had energy, and I felt attacks hitting me like I'd never felt before, but I actually felt like protection, like a wall of bronze, which couldn't get near me like never before. And that's what the masculine is called to do. And there's no ego. When you're stepping into the divine masculine, it's quite the opposite. You know you're putting yourself right in the firing line. See, the leaders of the world will sit there in their little refuges and bunkers there and basically get their politicians as cowards that they'll hide away to make all their orders while they're in their bunkers, shutting people's businesses down, taking away their rights, vaccinating them, putting fear in them, taking their livelihoods and then getting them fined for just trying to protect their families and go and get food. Whereas the shepherds and the leaders of the kingdom of God are the opposite. Like David, they, they go right into the firing line. They said, no, we lead by example. So this is giving you a little bit of a hint. And it says, in the eyes of them at sea shall no longer be dim. So basically, this is talking about a whole new age of the masculine and a whole new realm of the feminine. And you can see the divine feminine at work as well in Isaiah. It says, when the Lord has washed away the filth for the daughters of Zion, in other words, those of the women of the feminine, the daughter of the feminine, are getting cleansed from the spirit of judgment and burning, it says the Lord will create on every dwelling place of Mount Zion a cloud of smoke and a shining flaming fire for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And the word is actually a canopy or covering. Grace and I were talking this morning and she was saying she was getting visions or senses of creating a canopy or covering over the whole nation. I said, that's what the feminine do. That's why you, Christine, Natasha and, all have been, and others have been so busy. You're, getting, you're creating an ark, a spiritual sanctuary, a canopy. You're, you're what's called it. You're creating what's called the canopy for what's called the second phase. The, and I'll show you what I mean now by the second phase. So the man child, it's very important to get this. The man child, as you can see here, is that divine masculine, the saviors. So 
I'll put it here, the saviors or brethren of Christ, spoken about in Micah 5. Then you got here the child. Now, this is different. This is actually, I don't know, for want of a better word, the Enoch. So, in other words, the word child is not the same word as the word child here. So, isn't it interesting when you actually read what words say? Because people would teach you that when it says here that she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations of a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So you think, oh, yeah, the man child got caught to God in his throne. Well, possibly, but they're different words. This one was a singular man child, like a savior. This one here, actually, 77 of the 99 interesting numbers significance is plural. And it's a neutral one. In other words, it's not male or female. So, in other words, this is different. So, both men and women. Women being caught up, and the word means is exactly the same word, by the way, but is used in Thessalonians when it talks about the great snatching away. In fact, let me actually go to my notes on this because it'll actually. So, the same word is used here when Philip was caught up and translated in Acts 8 39. So, Philip was actually translated and instantly disappeared and ended up somewhere else. The same word is used there. When Paul was caught up into the third heaven, like J.J. Hertak, this is the same word used. 2 Corinthians, caught up in the paradise, when Paul was caught in the paradise. This was when those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So if you're not getting excited right now, you must, or at least getting some kind of stirring in your spirit, you're probably already dead. Because you could not get more exciting stuff if you tried here. This is basically talking about this here. So this is the first group of people. In other words, a dragon is waiting to get these ass kickers, to get these brethren. And then the brethren, these saviors, there's a group of people like Enoch, exactly the same like Enoch, like Mount Zion. They went straight up. There's part of an initial ascension, a disappearance, just like that. And whether they've actually turned their whole thing in the light body or simply translated into the light body, and they just use their physical body when they need it, which seems to be the case with most of these masters, there's an ascension. In other words, death, you've overcome the last enemy. That's death. That's like the first phase. So that's one group of people. The second group of people are the women. So this is what the one I'm not going to go to quite so much. So it's a whole different teaching, but let's just actually read what happens with the woman. So the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God to feed her for 1260 days. And when that, that number is always used in context with the great tribulation. In other words, this woman is physically on earth, but she's created some kind of ark or portal that makes absolutely certain that they cannot be touched. In other words, like a protective portal for basically the flock of Christ. In other words, the people. It's doing that exact thing I showed you about in Isaiah 32, about the man being a hiding place from the wind or about the woman creating a canopy and a place of glory with the help of the divine masculine working together. And at the same time, Michael has now cast out that great dragon out of heaven. So in other words, everyone's out of heaven now and, and into the earth. So in other words, now Satan is incarnated upon the earth. So notice what happens here. The warning that's given here is rejoice you heavens and those who dwell in them. In other words, rejoice those of you who are no longer attached to this earth. Rejoice those of you who've made that step. You've stepped into either the first phase, which is the Enoch phase, or you stepped into the woman. Because those who are in the woman is just a different version. The woman who's also in that trap. The woman's different to the masculine. Whereas the men come from a different place to go to war, and they're more about the war, what do women do? The women, although they will war, they protect. You ask any mother who's got kids, the first thing they'll do is protect their kids and they'll protect their cubs. What will they naturally do? They'll protect their community. I notice you look at the women in this work, the first thing they want to do is protect. They want to take care. They want to look after. They want to actually help people to get through this. So that's what the women naturally seek to do here. But notice, woe to those who are the earth and the sea. For the devil has come to you having a short time and knowing that. So basically, you've got a very pissed off Satan 
now on earth in the flesh um, with, with basically others. You can only see why basically Satan is going to pour out wrath upon the earth. And the first thing that the dragon did, once he saw he was cast on the earth and he now knew he could no longer get that man child, which meant he knew he was done, what did he next do? Now he starts to chase after the woman. So now he's after the woman. All the those who are what's called of the feminine art, those who are in the sanctuary, those who've been given that call and that task to build that sanctuary on planet Earth to give the people a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm. So now the dragon's going, right, well, I'm after this sanctuary now. I'm going to wipe this thing out. I can't get that group now. I'm going to go after this group. I am going to make sure that this group gets nowhere so I can have the whole earth. Basically, if I can't get them, I'm going to get the whole earth and I'm going to waste as much as I can. So what happens here? The woman was given two wings of a great evil. In other words, this also suggests an ascension. But she might fly. So there's also an ascension for the woman. I, I was given a vision 18 months ago. I can see when this thing happens, it's going to happen fast. It'll almost come when you least expect it, like this pandemic. And suddenly, just like that, I, and I got this vision. I actually saw people translating instantly and ending up in a physical location. There'll be a few places on Earth I see being like this, a few different islands. I really feel and believe Australia is going to be one of them, going to be the main one in the Western world. And then there's going to be various other places. But I got a vision of people being quickly translated, like bang, 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 bang. Those who are ready. And just like that, it translated. Just like Philip in 8, Acts 8.39, into a place where she's physically nourished for a time, a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And then what happens here is a serpent tries to get her, and I won't go into how this happens, but basically the woman's protected. So in other words, we can't physically get the mark of the beast or get any of the activities of the dark to this woman. So that's the second group of people. Now, this group of people, what's critical to know is how did they overcome the devil or Satan? They've got the blood of Christ to absolutely cleanse all their karma. The word of their testimony, in other words, they're speaking their truth. They're getting their message out. They're telling as many people as they can. They're, they're warning people to flee from the roughest to come. They're getting out and they're proclaiming the message and the power of this. And they loved not their lives to their death. They, in other words, they've done exactly what Christ said. They've denied themselves, taken up their cross and followed him. They've, all their money, their wealth is just purely, they've just completely given that over for the higher work. And yes, that doesn't mean they've suddenly done a vow of poverty or something dumb like that. They've just, made, they've just put their wealth in a trust. They're using it well. They're living abundantly, but they're also using their, their, their wealth to not only live abundantly and live the best, but do what Jesus said, where he says, love your neighbor as yourself, making sure that all those of the family of God are also looked after so that all can prosper all can be abundant that there will not be one poor among them which is exactly what the scriptures say um, in the in the book of Enoch or book of Moses with the said there wasn't a single poor um, in Zion it says in Isaiah 33 that in the coming days in this millennium as we're entering into it there won't be a single sick or poor person among them so in other words this will be a prosperous community this second phase of people Although they're still on planet Earth in the physical body serving on Earth, they're in, in the tribulation, they're completely protected because they're sealed off. They have the power to protect the people completely with the canopy. They can protect people with, by, by creating the canopy, creating the ark so that the enemy can't get near them. And they're making sure that the people in that sanctuary in that place are safe, following higher law and making sure that people are following the law of Christ and, being, and basically following the higher law. So bows in the sanctuary is a, a pit sanctuary in a way, but it's, it's a shepherding place. It's a portal. It's an ark. And it's a place of great prosperity. So in that sanctuary as well, in that second phase, what's called those who are still upon the earth. And in saying that, some of them, in fact, maybe all of them, or maybe certainly some of them would have turned into light body themselves, but chosen to stay on earth. They've chosen to stay physically here and not ascend and actually be here to serve. And they may, like Annalise Scarron, they may be in a light body, but they're actually in their physical body most of the time, moving around, using it like the guy in this particular book, Heaven and the Hereafter by Sundar Singh. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So it's a great reformation. So that's why you're going to be seeing glorious things 
there's a preparation for an Enoch ascension, a city of Zion or city of Enoch. That's the first group. The second group is the woman. In other words, a physical sanctuary on earth. For, for, for Israel of God, I'll call it. The place where the beast cannot touch or get anywhere near. And when he tries, what happens to him? This is the phase three. So I'll just give it a number to make it a bit easier to follow. Okay. So it's just got a comment here. So the third one is the rest of her seed. In other words, the Israel still attached to 3D earth. In other words, there's those who are still of this seed. This is a whole complicated kind of message again. So I'll keep it simple for now. So there's those who've done the work beforehand to move into the portal or move into the sanctuary and they've moved quick enough. In other words, the second phase, the first group have kind of moved the quickest. The second group have still moved very quickly and there's some who are leading in that second group and helping get a sanctuary and getting that place free. And you have a short time for those of you who know that's your path to help humanity. It's only a matter of time now before this mark, this implant is coming in. And so you're not just here to save yourself and your family, you're here to save a nation, a region. Big responsibility, everyone. All of you on this webinar right now, if you've been part of this work, that's the call that the Father's giving you today. It's not about you. It's about being, for some of you women, it's about being like Esther. And Grace can teach you about Esther if you want to know. But Esther, a woman who basically saved a whole nation in the midst of the Persian Empire. Um, Judith, who isn't in the Bible, but she's in the Apocrypha. Um, we had a book of Judith, which Herzog talks about. Great women, Barak, who stepped up and basically use their feminine power to basically save their people. Some of you women know, as I'll say these, that you're burning. You know, that this is part of your path. You're not just here to save yourself. You're here to save a nation. You're here to save a region. All I know is that I reckon that we've got 10 people in West Australia. If we have 10 people in West Australia, I know West Australia is now guaranteed to be spared. Um, if you have 10 people who are willing to be perfect in them. And it says a dragon was rough with the woman. In other words, he was furious. It's like, okay, fine. I can't touch you now. So what did he do? He went after the rest of them. In other words, those in Revelation 7 who came out of great tribulation, this is the group that... I their lives. These are the ones who... This is going to be where the man comes from. and economic and these are the ones that says to worship the beast and his image and you can see this here I'm going back to revelation 7 wow it's 12 12 i'm saying this so it says here they came out of great tribulation and their robes and made white then you go to revelation 15 And in I saw it, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then would have gotten the victory over the beast and his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing in of glass, the harps of God, singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the land. So saying, great and marvelous are your works, O God Almighty, just and true your ways, you king of saints. Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you. Your judgments are made manifest. So this is the third group. These are those who've gone through it, but they basically gotten victory over the beast. They refused to take the mark. Many heroes will come out of this time. People who didn't listen, who didn't listen, who didn't listen, but when the time finally came and they knew it was too late, stepped up to help many people. So there'll be many great heroes that will come out of this time, people that will be highly honored and wear the crown of the martyr. Some will even voluntarily choose 
to actually be martyrs. Some who've even done the work beforehand, but they will choose to go in there. Moses and Elijah, specifically Revelation 11, the two witnesses will, will choose the path of martyrdom. It says that to come and actually give up their lives. There's some apocryphal teaching that believes that actually teaches that John, the apostle John, will come back at the end and will actually teach the people and he will give up his life as well. So there are going to be many of these great saints and masters who actually choose voluntarily to give up their life. And it says many of these martyrs, it actually says, will actually rule and reign in Revelation 20 in the age to come. But they will voluntarily choose to do this. So basically, they'll do this as an example to show the rest of the world, you do not have to take this mark. There will be some who will choose that path. And they, in all honesty, are the ones who I probably have the greatest admiration for. Yeah, William said, I've always felt resonated with martyrs. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, some will, you kind of know, and some will choose that willingly. And Peter, for example, the apostle, in fact, it actually said he rejoiced, and so did Paul when you read, Peter actually rejoiced when he knew his day was coming, and was putting off his body. And Paul as well actually said they rejoiced. They absolutely went down the path of martyrdom with great gladness. They actually embraced that path. So there's going to be three different things, as you can see here. There's three phases. The main thing is once you kind of get a sense of you're resonating, you know that right now you're in a period of time when this is when I would be saying to everyone, this is a time right now to be cleansing every attachment to the earth. That's the moral of the story today. Cleansing all your karma. Letting go of everything. Giving everything up within yourself for the higher work. Knowing especially many of you and some and those who you work with, that they're going to require this sanctuary on earth. There has to be a place where people have a way out. This is what the Council of Nine told me specifically. There has to be a place where they can't be touched. And then you've got, of course, this one here, the man-child, the saviors, the first one, the Enochs, the ones who actually get ascended. So in summary, what we've got here, the child of the woman, the woman or remnant of Israel, the remnant of the woman's seed. So there's kind of three different groups happening here. As you can see here, three different groups. So, okay, so quite a bit there. I'm going to open it up now for questions or comments. And like I said, it's very important to understand this is, this is why we record these. So you can always watch it again. You can always get a bit of a sense of it. But understand. Feel into it as well as to where, you, as to what you feel for yourself and where you feel your path lies. And certainly realize the importance of more than ever before, but the one common message, no matter which, which path or whatever else, or which phase, understand that the best place to be in is what I call the place of choice. The place where you pretty much know you can choose whichever way you want to go and know that whatever you're doing, you're doing by choice. That's ultimate sovereignty. When Jesus came, he knew he was going to die. He knew that was his path. When Moses and Elijah are here and actually doing um, the two witnesses role in Revelation 11, they will know why they're here. They will know they're here for three and a half years to prophesy. And then at the end, when they finish their testimony, to be taken out by the beast. So the more you start, but all of them had done their cleansing work by the time comes. And that's the biggest message for everyone today. To love not the world nor the things in the world. Realize this is all passing away. Realize none of this actually matters at all. It's all a big illusion. It doesn't actually matter. And the only way you can lose your great inheritance is by getting back attached to the earth and doing what Jesus warned against, which is getting caught up in the things of the earth again. And that doesn't mean don't enjoy them. I enjoy my exercise. I eat now just for enjoyment, even though these days I don't really necessarily need to eat anymore, I'm finding. But I still have a little bit just because I, I like it. It keeps me grounded in the, in, in, in the 3D. But this is the day and the time where more than ever before, make your choice. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord.
Christine, wow, that was a journey. Thanks for spelling it out. Yeah, look, I got led to really teach this and you'll find that having this all written out, it'll become easier and easier. And I've no doubt that as time goes on, I'll be showing more deeper stuff within that because some of it I'm still unraveling myself. The main thing that I do know is that there's these three different groups that are clearly talked about. And some of the women, especially on this webinar, I feel are, are part of building this arc, building this, this arc, this canopy. So any questions? Because what I'll do is I'll do an activation so they integrate and then we can go from there. And then I'll hand it back to Grace. So how have you found it, say everyone? Just some good feedback. That's for those of you who wish to tithe. So any feedback? William enjoyed. Sam, fantastic. Tasha enjoyed you speaking over me. No, thank you. Tasha, yeah, well, look, everyone of you is open. And so remember today, this is what I was doing today just to teach you all was I was speaking to the spirits. This, this message was for the spirit realm. And Grace would remember that Brown, this is what Brian taught, taught me, if I remember. You always speak to the spirits. And then that, will, then that does the work in the people. And in a way, I'd lost that. Um, I'd forgotten about that. Whereas I've been coming back to that, what, what Brian taught me years ago, which is always speak to the spirits. And we're now going to start behaving with all of you more and more. And you're going to notice your ability to do the work and hear the truth. And this is going to clear out these implants faster than just about anything. Yeah, look, no problem. Look, this is just great. The one thing you find, Sam, is the more you get given the power of God, the more anointing, the more you actually serve. For me, I'm actually realizing for the first time in my life that what Jesus said, that the greater you are, actually is the more you serve. That the more you get given, the more you actually are expected to serve. The more you're expected to put your life on the line. The more you're expected to put everything on the line. That's what's expected of you. And so it's a big responsibility to be um, basically, any, to, to basically work in Christ's kingdom. It, it's a big time. It's a big responsibility and a very honored one. And some of you will be called to put yourself in the gap for your neighbors. Some of you, I'm telling you prophetically, you will be called to stand in the gap for your cities. You will feel led and you will be getting wisdom. You'll be connecting with the group and talking about others and saying, I'm feeling misleading. Can you give me some guidance? I want to make sure I do this. I want to make sure that I don't get, you know, severely hurt from doing this. So, but there's some of you that are going to start getting led in the coming days to so standing in the gap for your city. So you'll say, I'll stand in the gap. If you're going to come in here, then you're going to come through me. You've got to come through the people of our city. That's bringing the kingdom of God to earth, everyone. That's when you're really bringing the kingdom of God to earth. When you're saying, there's a new government here, Satan. This is now who rules this area. This is now who rules West Australia. This is now who rules Queensland. It's a big statement to make, and you make it when you're really ready, but saying, we're now in charge. You've got to come and talk to us. That's what Christ said. So just really let this code just fill you. Breathe it right in your third eye by focusing all the mental energy in the center of your head, right between your eyebrows. Let it just absorb into you. Just let it breathe it in through the nose for four, the hole for four, and just breathe out for six to eight.
I'm just going to give thanks to Christ, to Enoch, to Elijah and Moses. Lahiri Messiah, Sri Yaketswa, Babaji. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Mother, Mother Mary, Mrs. Sophia, in her fully redeemed, glorious state. Mary Magdalene, and allow the Spirit of the Divine Mother working with the Father, the woman of wisdom, to work in the hearts, especially of the women here, but in all of us, to bring the great wisdom of the Divine Feminine. I also ask of the Father, the great wisdom of the Divine Masculine, clearing at all implants, all blocks, anything, stopping people from seeing the eye of truth. I'm just seeing them just fly out of people right now. I'm hardly saying or doing a thing. It's just stuff just went flying out of people's energy fields. Some of you would have felt that straight away. Just a whole lot of stuff just went straight out of you. At least five people felt that, Ben. If that was you, just type a Y. Yeah, Isaac. Yeah, with others of you happening to, I'm telling you, Natasha had a whole lot of stuff to her a minute ago. Whether you felt it or not, I don't know, Natasha, but you had a whole lot of stuff fly out. Lexi did. going to make a command now it is commanded by the blood of christ and by the law of the golden liquid realms and the chemical powers by the powers of all those aligned with the christ and with the higher work to release all implants all chains all swords or blocks or any spears in each and every person right now preventing them doing the higher work on all levels and all dimensions in the highest priority state now Remove those swords, those upside down sword impacts that have been put in people right now, especially in Lexi, the upside down sword or cross. There's things out of people's third eyes and out of their spines, out of their back. It's like I've seen crisscrosses and networks that have been put there with sharp things going in. They're coming out right now, like steely little thin things. Yeah, the crown of thorns, the upside down cross. There's just a lot of stuff that's just being unraveled. Quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's healings. There's a healing happening in various parts right now. Tasha and my heart. Yeah, interesting you say that because I was just about to say, um, I saw someone, someone, a couple of people getting healed in their heart. Swords and daggers in their heart, wounds in their third eye, wounds from a friend is what I was getting. Clearing that out. 
someone's being healed in their throat chakra right now. Some kind of block or witchcraft or voodoo, which is just prevent you speaking out. You've just been healed of it now, just completely clear. Yeah, Miko. Yep. Sam, overwhelmed with emotion, shaking, feeling like I'm being made 10 times bigger on the inside. Yeah, expanding massively. Absolutely. Bringing out your full feminine warrior power is a word I'm getting, Sam. You're a fighter. You know, you're born for fight. You're born for, to fight. You actually, that's all I'm seeing. Bringing it all out, the warrior in you, the inner warrior. Stand strong and fight. For your people, your neighbors, your family. That's the picture I'm getting for you. Something in you wants to fight and you're willing to do it. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, resonates with, yeah, I can see that. That's the vision I'm getting. They're just saying they all they're saying to me about you is they're giving you they're gonna give they're giving you your wish. Yeah, they're going to be getting people standing in the gap in the coming days. And that's why they're uniting people together to make sure it's done coordinated, done with wisdom, done with certainty and working together as a team. That's what they're saying to me. Because the day has gone past, there's some brave, many of you are actually very brave, courageous people. You've been willing to stand in the gap and do stuff. But moving forward, they're now bringing people together in a team. That's the message they're giving me right now. In the same way, these masters work as a team. They don't work in isolation. They're working as a team. Because they know that without a team, they got no chance. Without working together as a group or family or brotherhood of counsel, they all work together as a brotherhood, each one knowing their place, each knowing the authority of each other, each knowing who's in charge, but also each knowing what each one's here to do. Even in this code, you'll be seeing various masters and they're all working together in synchronicity. Ones that some would think are completely different to each other. And although they are different, they all have different roles to play. Elijah, Moses, Enoch, Babaji, Yiketswa. You couldn't think of really such more different people or different masters, but yet they all work together. Yeah, Fiona feels like sucked into a vortex and the earth was being sucked like around me and combining. Yeah. It's amazing what's happening with the feminine here, Fiona. I can see the divine feminine opening up because the space and the power that, that, that the women have is divine feminine. Grace knows I'm talking about. It's almost, you literally are almost an arc or portal like this woman. You hold a sacred space. You can hold a whole community. You can hold a whole group of people. You've actually got such power as the divine feminine. And some of you just getting a sense of, of how powerful you really are. Alex, feeling relief in my back, very bright and third eye. Yeah. Christine, a lot of emotion in the webinar. Now there's a calmness. Yeah, I can feel the calmness now. Coach is doing the work. Just getting a sense to do one more activation with this code. We're going to do an auric activation. Activating all into the highest priority in each and every person in the first three levels and up the levels.
merging them with the mirror opposite edges and bringing in the Christ opposite edges up the levels. Cleansing demons, thought forms, soul fragments, personalities of others, etc., on all levels. Oh, that's strong. I'm sure you're feeling it, William. Clearing out all incarnations, all bits and pieces, any kind of its thought forms, anything that does not align with the higher purpose and higher thoughts of each person now. Well, it's a strong art clearing. Yeah, Yeshua is here. Correct. Absolutely. We're just basically providing a fertile escort to take any discarnates who are in the way, through to realms justly earned, and putting them in a pale silver reflector, or letting the karma be completed, and let Yeshua be present in the hearts of each and every person now. Wow, I can see him, William. I see what you mean. He's standing really tall, like a like a master. Okay, starting to clear a bit now. It's still going. Oh, I'm feeling it all my arms still. Yeah, there's a lot of clearing. I keep going to stop it and I can't. It's just, gosh, it's just heavy. I asked him what he's clearing. He just said bruises. Bruises from stripes, from wounds, is what he's telling me. Woundings that have happened to people over the years. Bruisings. He's given me a scripture in Psalm 129 where it says, yeah, plowmen. It says, plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows deep. In other words, the wounds and the stripes have been very deep. But the Lord is righteous. And he breaks us free from the cords of the wicked. So he's clearing cords from the wicked. Yeah, it's really powerful. I'm still feeling it. I'm feeling his love touching my heart. So William, wow, William saw him pull something out of me. Which part of my energy field or body? I think I know where, but in fact, I know where, but you tell me what you saw, Will. Out of my shoulders, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's I've been in one area. Was it my left or right? Or both? Because that's been I was actually telling someone the other week, it's the only area of my body which still had a few little things going on and it wasn't much, just small. Yeah, right, left, that's been the, the shoulder. Wow. It was a splinter, wasn't it, Will? Some kind of splinter or bruise. Just, just at the top. Yeah. Gosh, I see Yeshua in, in his power. So much love and yet so much power. 
you see the white robe he's wearing? Well, it's like a white kind of, not like pure white, this one's a different kind of one. It's like a priestly garment he's wearing today. And he's standing there looking quite serious, but yet gentle. And it's like, yes, yeah, I can't put it in the words. It's like he has so much power over the enemy, I can't even imagine it. He has so much power over the enemy, I just can't fathom it. I've never seen him like this. It's like there's nothing on this planet that can even touch him. Yeah, Scepter. He's doing something with the Scepter too, isn't he? Tell me what you're seeing, because I can see what he's doing. I'm hearing the words royalty. Yeah. Yeah, pointing and using it with strength and courage in the people. He's also telling me, well, he's actually saying to me, I want you to use this scepter as well. It's like he's wanting to get others involved. That's what I'm seeing. He's actually giving me, he's actually saying to me, oh, he wants me to use that scepter as well. I don't know if you're seeing that part of it, but it's like I can use it if I want to. Yes, he's handing it to certain people. Yeah, scepter, rod and staff, yeah, to shepherd, but he's specifically telling me to use this scepter for shepherding. Kind he's handing it out to whoever wants to take it and use it for shepherding. He's saying I'm raising up shepherds, that's what he's telling me that right now. He's raising up shepherds. Seven shepherds and eight princes of men, it says in Micah. Fifteen is actually there's been 15 people all webinar too. Christine, lots of tears. Yep, yeah, he's giving that. He's giving that scepter. He's asking Sam if she's ready. Will I do it? Yeah. I can hear him. He's wanting people to shepherd their communities, shepherd their people. Yep. He's raising up shepherds. Sam, I'm here. I'm ready. Take me, use me. I love it. Those of you who are farmers here would know what a shepherd is. The shepherd nurtures the sheep, protects them. He's saying to me, no, I've never seen this either, William. William's saying, I've never seen anything like this. Yeshua. Sam, I'm feeling less of this earth. That makes sense. Yeah. He's just saying, the only time I've seen him like this, William, is in Micah. I see this in Micah 5. So whenever I see red Micah 5, I see him like this. Fiona's here in the sheep bar. Yeah. You know how these sheep are helpless. Jesus, when he, Jesus said, but he looked at the people and he saw that they were sheep without a shepherd and he felt compassion for them. And the truth is, these people have no idea of what's coming, but we do. They have no idea. They're going straight into the slaughter to be vaccinated, to be chipped. And true shepherds will fight off the wolves. That's the message of today of Jesus, he's saying. True shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He fights for the he fights the wolves off. You're a protector. You're a shelter in the midst of storm. Yeah, he's healing the heart. Yeah. 
He's healing hearts everywhere here right now, William. Yeah, your heart is your weapon. Because your heart is where you love out of, you come from love. It's worth remembering everyone that when Christ did his greatest miracles, he did his miracles from absolute compassion. He did it, he turned, he created food out of nothing because he saw people starving and he felt for them. Many people he healed because he felt for them and he healed them. That's what he said in Isaiah 35. He says, when you, when you stand as a shepherd and say to the weak, be strong, do not be fearful hearted. Behold, the father will come with vengeance and will save you. It says, then the, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer. Then waters will burst forth in the wilderness and springs in the desert. That's when, that's when the power of, of awakening breaks out over the country. Sam, at the same time, I'm feeling more grounded, more centered, more focused. It's funny, William, I'm seeing him hit a gong right now. It's like he's releasing something right out of the heart using a gong. It's quite weird. Just hit, hit, hit a gong. Yeah, a vibration hit me. Yeah, he's expanding everyone's energy fields even more. Wow, I can just see this expansion happening. He's moving etheric layers more deeper and broader. Oof, it's strong. He's raising us up to be soldiers and fight for what's right. Exactly. Yeah. He's raising up warriors, he said. <laughs> he's saying, I'm raising up. He just said to me, he's raising up warriors, not wins. People who will fight for the faith is what he's saying to me. Fiona, it's interesting as today Darren is plowing our paddock ready for new seed. Yeah, you farmers are always prophetically ahead, Fiona. I love it. Because the farmers, Jesus always talked about farmers in scripture. Yeah, exactly. Plowing it ready for new seed. We're getting ready for new seed, new harvest. Sam, I see us all in our light bodies standing together waiting for instructions of readiness and amazing energy radiating from us. Exactly. That's why he's fast tracking things. Yeah, I feel grace for you to come on now. I'll still stay here, but you come in as well, I feel. 
feel there's some kind of thing now that's you're sensing or William's getting something else, but I feel that someone you, you're getting something, Grace, or there's something that you'll get when you speak. So if you want to take the mic. Actually, a wonderful friend of mine who I'm pretty um, close to, she actually just arrived in my house. And what I've been feeling into it is by her coming into my house, what does that signify? And what's the symbol for it and so as you look at this code and what you see in there what you perceive in there think of it as a friend what a close friend a precious friend that has come to you and what does it mean for you so i really encourage you to look again at the code and if you can think or feel in the in your time of this lifetime the precious friend that has come your way what message is that for you <clears throat> so my friend that's come along today we've worked uh for a few years now we've worked something deeply together and she means she's really special in my heart so for her to come into my house today it's like the Holy Spirit coming in. Holy Spirit is our guide, our teacher. And just remembering the sweetness, allowing myself to remember the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, the sensitivity, and um, how precious it is. Makes me think of Revelation 3.21, where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man wants me to come in, um, I will come in and dine with him and sup with him and him with me. So it's kind of like your friend. That's a sign, Grace. Like Jesus knocking on the door of your heart to come in deeper and basically hang out with you more. Yes. So it's like, but her coming into my house is 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 exactly that. Um, open the door, for I'm always knocking at your door, and I, I wait. And as you open the door, I can come in and fellowship with you. So. <clears throat> My friend who's sitting right next to me now, it's like we're having fellowship from the heart. And we're having fellowship and connecting in the mind because we're both like-minded and the same of heart. We're both mums. And um, she's doing wonderful things in what she's doing. But for her to come here, it's like a fellowship of my dear friend. And so a fellowship of the Holy Spirit, fellowship of Yeshua, fellowship of god source whatever you call universal or god designer the designer of all creation so it's like uh, william said earlier that yeshua is here so clearly yeshua is here and having fellowship with all of us here even though we're not together locally physically but in the spirit Yeshua is with us, combining us together and putting us into a fellowship. So when you look at this guide, for example, you can see the circles. Sam, a few days ago, she said that um, she saw five figures in this code. And so if we can combine us together right now, holding hands and we're having fellowship with each other. And the center of that is Christ. The center of it is the illuminated, illuminated light of Christ joining forces with us and combining us all together and so that the powerful force that comes from christ will just go through and reveal to each one of us here as we fellowship brilliant So that's really what I guess, really the true fellowship. 
and that Yeshua is our friend, a friend that we can talk to, rely on, and com bring comfort and supporting as well. Thank you, Grace. Who's your friend? Paula. Oh, Paula. Say hello, Paula. Hey, hello. Paula. Hi. Hi, Warren. <laughs> <clears throat> Lovely. Well, I feel now, I feel now we're finishing up now. And this afternoon, for those of you from the Perth thing, I'll message you separately at 4.30. I'm just doing a bit of a get together from our Holy Cross and that. I mean, five o'clock, I'm going to be um, teaching you this advanced stuff about the mother for those who want to be there. So if you want to be there, just message me privately. Um, but yeah, this is going into deeper stuff where we're really preparing for war to know our real enemy. So this is what this afternoon is going to be about. So I'll be ending it right now. But yes, so is there anyone just type in the chat? I mean, obviously, there's those of you on the Facebook group, Messenger, like Christine and others, you, are, are, you know, you'll be getting the message there. Is there anyone else who is not on it but keen to be in that one? Lexi, yep. Okay, yeah, so it's going to be five o'clock Perth time, Lexi. So it's going to be like, what's the time now? It's... Um, yeah, so it's four hours from now it's going to be. So I'll send you the link. And Isaac, yep, no problem. I'll, I'll make sure you get it as well. So, and Steve, so Lexi, Steve, Isaac, Natasha. Yep, Lexi, Steve, Natasha, and Isaac. So done. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for being willing to serve. And I look forward to seeing you later on today.